everybody. In just a moment, we'll be starting the presentation. I wanted to point out the fact that this webinar is being recorded. And in addition to that, if at any point in the course of the presentation you have a question, you can ask it using the dialog box on the control panel of uh, the GoToWebinar. And we are going to try to save them during uh, for the Q&A uh, session at the end of the presentation, but if there's something that is particularly uh, timely or appropriate and relevant to a, to a slide, you've got an urge to ask it, I'll be able to field those maybe on the fly and, uh, and ask. Otherwise, as I said, we're going to have the, the bulk of the Q&A take place at the conclusion of Christian Greiner's comments. Uh, as I mentioned, the webinar is being recorded. And with that, I've noticed I a few stragglers coming in now. But we'll go ahead in the interest of time and kick things off. As a, a notice to everybody, we have a fairly lengthy presentation, a little longer than what we usually do. It's going to run over half an hour. Uh, but just so you're aware, it is important stuff. And if you're able to, if you're able to stick it out, I know it's a little dense. You're gonna have to put your thinking caps on. But if you're able to stick it out, you're gonna you're gonna walk away with some really valuable knowledge. And uh, so that's that's sort of the disclaimer there. But with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So good afternoon again, and welcome to the Dot Asset Management's presentation on active versus versus passive investing. Who's right? Uh, it's a critical look at both sides of the financial debate. I'll go ahead. And move on to slide two here where you'll see a quick rundown of what we'll be discussing today. Christian Greiner, Portfolio Manager for the Azad Ethical Fund, is going to give us an education or a lesson on terms like efficient market hypothesis, active share, things like that, alpha, beta, we're going to learn a lot. And he's going to show you why they matter when framing the debate over active versus passive investing. We'll conclude with a look at recent performance and what may account for some of the bias we're seeing currently in favor of passive strategies, and also suggest why that bias might not be a good thing going forward. So I've already alluded to him a couple times, but we'll go ahead and meet the presenter for today. Uh, I am there on your right. My name is Josh. I'm the Investment Communications Director with Azad Asset Management. I'm going to be turning the bulk of the presentation over to the man on the left of your screen there, that's Mr. Christian Greiner, who's the Vice President at Ziegler Capital Management and the Portfolio Manager of the Azad Ethical Fund, which is our mid-cap growth mutual fund. Christian's going to be joining us uh, momentarily to talk about that debate uh, uh, over active versus, versus passive strategies. And uh, with that, we'll move right along into a word from our sponsor about Azad Asset Management, who we are, what we do. I'll just very quickly run through this. Uh, hopefully you know who we are, what we've done, and what we uh, continue to do. But very quick background, we're a boutique firm located just outside D.C., registered with the SEC as an investment advisory firm, and we sponsor two halal mutual funds, including the Azad Ethical Fund, which I've mentioned and we'll touch on briefly today. We also handle model portfolios for institutional and retail clients. Moving right along, we are probably different from some of the rank and file plain vanilla investment advisors that you come across. And one of the reasons for that is our dual mission philosophy, and that's a mission that focuses on generating competitive long-term financial returns while using investment capital to promote a sustainable economy and a positive societal impact. And our vision is a world in which investment capital is used to help build a sustainable and equitable economy. As such, all of our products and investments comply with halal investment guidelines as established by the accounting an auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions, often referred to as a OFI for short. What does this mean? It means we steer clear of investments like financial services, alcohol, pornography, weapons of mass destruction, and the like. We're also a member of the Forum for Sustainable and Responsible Investment, which you see on your screen, as well as the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, or ICCR. All right, now that we've gotten that short little introduction out of the way, let's turn to the first section of today's presentation efficient market hypothesis and what that has to do with active and passive investing. With that, I'll turn things over to Christian Greiner. Christian, are you there? All right. Well, thanks, Josh. Uh, today we're going to discuss a topic that's been getting a lot of ink within the uh, financial and, and the mainstream press, really, and that's whether investors 
would be better off having their funds placed under active management or put into passive management vehicles. And for the sake of our broad audience today, uh, I thought it might be best to first define what these terms mean for the sake of our discussion. Active management is what a lot of people visualize when they think about their investments, be it for their retirement, for their kids' education funds, or other investment goals. They have an X amount of money, and that money is placed with the broker or financial advisor, or it's placed in a mutual fund that's run by a portfolio manager. At some point, that money is put to work within the capital markets, where an individual with decision-making authority buys and sells securities, stocks or bonds, with the goal of capital appreciation. At various times, that decision-making individual will buy and sell those securities to take advantage of conditions within the financial market. They might feel that a security is either overpriced or underpriced given the underlying company's prospects or risk profile. For example, a portfolio manager like myself might think that Apple stock is undervalued because they have reason to believe that the iWatch will be a bigger hit than people realize. At the same time, they feel IBM stock is overpriced because they have survey work that shows that the offerings in the cloud are falling behind those of, the, of their competition. So they might sell the fund's IBM stock and use those proceeds to buy Apple stock. Passive management works a little bit differently. An individual investor or their broker or advisor may feel that their client would benefit from exposure to a certain part of the capital markets. Maybe it is in U.S. stocks or U.S. corporate bonds, maybe stocks in Japan. However, instead of choosing individual stocks or bonds, they might want to get a broad exposure to that entire market. They do this by buying an index mutual fund or an ETF that's tied to an index for whatever asset class they want to gain a broader exposure to. Then they own a security that effectively puts their money to work in many different securities at their weight in that index. They've taken out the risk of individual stock selection or individual security selection, but have also limited the return to the performance of that particular index. In our example here, the investor buys the popular SPY ETF. They gain exposure to both IBM and Apple, as well as the other 498 stocks within the S&P 500 index. So at the heart of this discussion is if an investor should go with active or passive management is an academic theory known as the efficient market hypothesis. It was developed by Nobel Prize winning Professor Eugene Fama in 1970. It states that it is impossible to beat the market because stock market efficiency causes existing share prices to always incorporate and reflect all relevant information. So it believes that stocks always trade at their fair value on stock exchanges, making it impossible for investors to either purchase undervalued stocks or sell stocks uh, for inflated prices. Therefore, it should be impossible to outperform the overall market through expert stock selection or market timing, and that the only way an investor could possibly obtain higher returns is by purchasing riskier investments. In simpler terms, it states that capital markets react so quickly to all known information, both that that's in the press and even that with, that some key individuals within companies may hold, that it is impossible to beat the market. On its surface, it seems like a really sensible theory, especially in 2015, when information moves so quickly and electronic trading can be done in milliseconds. However, as any academic will tell you, the real world really doesn't always per perfectly conform to whatever research findings you have. Fama himself would later go on and find several phenomena within capital markets that call into question if capital markets are perfectly efficient. All this leads to three different schools of thought in applying uh, this efficient market hypothesis. So it, it, when you take a look at the efficient market hypothesis, it takes uh, one of three forms, uh, according to some practitioners. The first of these is the strong form, which is almost a literal, literal interpretation of this theory, that stock prices reflect what the general public knows and also what company insiders know that executives will buy and sell company stock based on how they feel that the company's prospects are. The second of, of these forms is the semi-strong form, and it could be interpreted that markets react to new public information very quickly, so that by the time an investor has sat down and, and analyzed a company's future prospects or uh, have taken a good, uh, strong look through the financial statements, that the stock price has already been bid up or sold down to reflect that information. And the third of these is, is what's known as the weak form. It states that future stock prices cannot be predicted by looking at market action in the past. That is, you can't study past mark charts of, of price action and try to find a pattern and profitably trade on that type of information. One can, however, use skilled analysis 
of a company's future prospects to gain excess returns and beat the market. It won't be easy. Uh, there's a lot of analysts and, and portfolio managers trying to do the same thing quicker than you, but it is possible. Okay, so Christian, uh, now that we've looked at the, the three types of uh, EMH uh, forms, strong, semi-strong, and weak, I'm sure everybody's curious to know which one's correct. Well, that's a good question, and, and there have been a, a countless number of academic papers and, and articles that can be used as proof of one form or, or the other. Uh, the answer that seems to be thrown around by a number of uh, great thinkers nowadays is, is a hybrid of the semi-strong and weak form. The, the thinking is that markets are not perfectly efficient, uh, that securities are mispriced, and that investors can take advantage of this. However, the information age has reduced the time that investors have to exploit this, and that, in an effect, it looks a lot like the semi-strong form. So using what we know about how markets work, this makes a lot of sense. There are hedge funds that robotically trade on headlines and earnings releases that come off uh, Bloomberg and other news feeds. That feels like a, an almost instantaneous market reaction, doesn't it? Okay. But, but however, with, with all these inefficiencies, uh, that with, all the with all the efficiencies that are in the market, there are a number of well-known market anomalies that in an efficient market should not exist. It still holds true that buying stocks with pro positive price momentum could be a winning strategy in a lot of markets. It still holds true that smaller company stocks, certain smaller company stocks, go up in January as investors come back into the market after doing tax selling on, on some of those names in December. Fama himself shows that stocks with low price to book ratios and high dividend yields outperform their index cohort. And the idea that investors actually overreact or underreact to this information in the marketplace. Uh, for a company causes security mispricings, leading to a, a school of thought called behavioral finance. Okay, Christian, so many of us may be aware that the efficient market hypothesis held sway in financial circles for decades. I remember studying this back in business school. But it's also true that the financial markets, when they crashed in 2008, 2009, uh, we saw a bit of renewed criticism, let's just say, of the theory as something that works well on paper, but not necessarily in the real world. So where do we stand now? Well, what, one thing uh, that we could take a look at here is, is this nice quote from Jeremy Grantham, who's, who's one of the, uh, the bigger deep thinkers within uh, fund management. And he used his, uh, his uh, firm's quarterly newsletter in 2009 to take this on firsthand. He criticized financial professionals, but also regulators, academics, as using the EMH as a reason not to do their jobs, under the belief that with asset bubbles that they really couldn't form if markets were efficient. Uh, Grantham went on to remind us that the market is full of major league inefficiencies, as he called them. The problem is, as Grantham learned during the tech bubble in the 1990s, that these inefficiencies don't correct overnight. Grantham saw tech valuations as a bubble and stayed underweight at these tech names, even though it hurt performance for a couple of years and is standing uh, with, within the financial community and with uh, some of his key clients. Eventually, his firm's view was validated, uh, but that was only after the bubble broke. The lesson here on some marketed efficiencies is that sometimes that they do take years to form, and other times they do take years to unwind. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, now that we've gotten sort of the academic uh, portion uh, out of the way, let's move on uh, to the basics of, of active and, and passive uh, management, which is the, the next section of today's webinar. So, Christian, back to you. All right. Well, so let's, let's take a look at some of these organizations that, that try to beat these market indices by finding those market inefficiencies. And these are what we call active managers. Active managers subscribe to some variety of, of the weak form of efficient markets. They believe that uh, there are inefficiencies out there and that they have proven ways of finding them and, and taking advantage of them. They can do this in a number of ways, and, and we'll go into these shortly. But what it all boils down to it is that active managers are trying to, to maximize return for their clients for a given level of risk. And the key to understanding this relationship is separating the component of an investment portfolio or, or a uh, mutual fund's return. Okay. So there's, an, there's an entire industry that revolves around judging if an active manager is doing their job or not. There are consultants, uh, computer programs, websites that will tell you if your manager is beating their benchmark and if they're beating it the right way. Uh, the right way comes down to if your manager is getting enough return for the risk that they are taking in the market relative to the benchmark. And the return of a mutual fund or, or really any portfolio of securities can be broken down 
into two components. The first of these is beta, and think of that as risk. If an investor is taking the same risk as uh, they, they would see in the market, their portfolio has a beta of exactly one. They are taking the same risk as the market and should expect the same return. Now think of a portfolio of stocks who on a historic basis is twice as volatile as the market. If the market goes up 5%, they might be up 10%. However, that same math works on the downside as well. If the market goes down 5%, these stocks could be down 10%. That portfolio would have a beta of 2. You're taking more risk, but you expect to be rewarded for taking that risk. Any portfolio return that you get that differs from that beta risk level is called alpha. So say you, your portfolio has a beta of 1 and the market goes up 5%. If your portfolio has a return of 6%, then your portfolio has what we call 1% of positive alpha. You've gotten more return than for the risk that you took, and that's a good thing. If it returned 4%, then you have an alpha of minus 1%. You did not get as much return as you got for the risk that you took. And as we stated before, an active manager's job is to maximize that portfolio's return for that given level of risk that their client is comfortable taking. In a matter of simplification, they are trying to maximize that alpha. The way to do this can take many paths. However, the goal remains the same. The manager is trying to find ways to evaluate profitabilities of companies, the risks of those firms, and if the market for those firms' securities have mispriced that relationship. And some managers will try to accomplish this by providing a better, unique set of information. They'll take a look at industry surveys. They'll talk to key opinion makers. They'll hire experts on a particular industry who will tell them uh, how, you know, how to rate each company within the industry's uh, prospects. However, the sheer volume of this information, it can be staggering at times. And uh, frankly, maybe not all of it's relevant to making an investment decision. It might be really good to know, but it doesn't really move the stock. Firms will take this information and try to process it so that their decisions can be made in a quicker amount of time through filters and procedures. So no matter what they're doing, when one is looking at a company like it's a business and trying to forecast how that business will do in the future, we call it as, as looking at the fundamentals. And that is what the majority of active managers do. So when most people think about investment management, they think about fundamental managers. These fundamental managers often hire industry-specific analysts who develop intricate company models who will forecast profitability out for years to come with, with uh, varying uh, degrees of success. Uh, these analysts cultivate sources. Uh, many have worked in the industry beforehand. Many have spent years covering uh, the same industry. They feed their information to a portfolio manager who takes various analysts buy and sell recommendations and then the portfolio manager constructs a portfolio of these securities that fits within the risk specifications that they see fit. And often, really, this is a formalized process within a lot of firms. For example, at some firms, Monday and Tuesdays might be analyst presentation days. Wednesdays might be for further questions. Thursday for portfolio construction. And Friday, they'll actually do the trading. An analyst might present uh, Apple stock on that iWatch theory that we discussed earlier that the stock price is not giving the company credit for future profits stemming from this. They might even put a price target of what they think is a fair value for Apple stock. The portfolio manager might follow up with questions the next day about some of the sales assumptions for the watch that he saw in, in the analyst's model. On Thursday, the portfolio manager may construct what a portfolio would look like with Apple in there and, and what stock they would like to trim or take out. And on Friday, the, the trading staff of the fund would execute that trade. And a, a couple issues really come approach uh, with this approach. They, they come to mind almost immediately. And the first of these is if the investment team is making that particular decision to, to buy Apple and sell another stock, what's stopping a dozen others from making that same decision with the same information and possibly quicker? And the second issue is with having all of this particular staff, all these analysts, all this trading staff, and the costs it takes to hire them, is that adding enough to the fund's performance to justify the cost. So with the Azad Ethical Fund, we have a bit of a different model than this. We take a lot of the data that these fundamental analysts look at and put it through a quantitative scoring system, uh, depending on the, the different industries and, and size of the stocks, and, and build our decisions out of that. Stocks are to, that are to be added to portfolio go through a fundamental review process that makes sure that the numbers that we have in that quantitative system are, are, are really telling a compelling investment story. And then the portfolio manager 
takes positions in highly rated stocks that will maximize the alpha. Okay, great. Nice little synopsis of uh, how that process works with the Azada Fund, which differs a little bit, as you said, from uh, some of the other methods out there. Uh, with that, though, let's go ahead and take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of that active management. Well, the advantages are really something that hasn't been getting a lot of press lately. An investor gets to put their funds uh, when they're in active management with a professional that often has invested through market cycles and, and learned lessons in market behavior from that. The portfolios might also benefit from being exposed to uh, analysts, especially those who understand emergent and disruptive technologies within industries that might not be fully understood by the market just yet. The experience of, of these fund managers may come to light during market downturns. Managers can dial down the risk of a portfolio. Uh, sort of dialing down that beta during periods of market stress, preserving capital, and possibly limiting losses when compared to benchmark returns. Another advantage is that an active manager can customize their offerings for different investor concerns. They can have portfolios that take higher risks. They can have portfolios that take lower risks, depending on an individual investor risk appetites and time horizons. And like the Azad Ethical Fund, they can tailor their products for social responsibility concerns. And finally, an actively managed investment product can offer the possibility of higher than index returns, the idea of getting more return for that level of risk that you are taking. However, all these advantages, they, they do come at a cost, a, a trade-off, and, and, and sometimes literally. Active managers often charge a much higher fee as a percent of assets invested than a passively managed product would. A number of active managers have recognized this, and we've seen fees come down within many actively managed asset classes. With the Azad Ethical Fund, our fee is recognized as being one of the lower ones within our peer group as recognized by Morningstar. The second problem is, is that a manager buying or selling securities during the year, uh, with all those transactions, tax consequences might occur from the capital gains being incurred on, on securities sold for a gain. The third risk is that a manager's investment style just may fall out of favor. They might be a fund that has always been tilted towards tech and healthcare stocks when consumer discretionary stocks are in vogue. They might be trading on valuation principles when it seems like all that the market cares about for a, a period of time is price momentum. What one has to look at in an investment manager is that they have a consistent market cycle tested process that they have a history of sticking to through good times or bad. The stock selection process the ethical fund uses has been around for over 15 years. The final risk that, that one is starting to really starting to get the attention that it deserves is that your manager is getting paid the fee of an active manager, but really is operating something closer to an index fund. And these types of funds are, are sometimes derisively called closet indexers. The notion, and this builds upon the notion of active share. Uh, active share is a notion that comes out of academic research in the 2000s. Simply put, it's adding up the exposures of all the ways that your portfolio is different than the benchmark index. An index fund would, that would have no difference in the weights uh, from the index, so it would be very close to zero in terms of active share. A fund that is entirely different from the benchmark, holding none of the stocks within that benchmark, is 100%. And according to the research uh, by, by the initial paper and some afterwards, High active share managers tend to outperform their benchmark with a lot of that having to do with better performance on the downside. Uh, these findings are still a point of contention within, between academics and investment consultants about the methodology and the findings, and there's going to be more research on this particular subject. So active share really isn't a perfect measure, but it should be combined with other measures of a fund's risk and, and performance to paint a full picture of what a fund manager is, at, is actually doing. It really gives uh, investors a good starting place, though, to see if your manager is deviating enough from the benchmark to possibly justify that fee that they're charging you. For the Azad Ethical Fund, our active share is 85%, and as we can see uh, on the graphic, uh, that play places us firmly in the active range. So we'll now switch our focus to passive management, investment vehicles that try to match their benchmarks retur benchmark uh, index return. It may surprise some people that passive management isn't really a new concept. The first index portfolio was created in 1970 for institutional clients, and Vanguard rolled it out the first index investment option uh, for the general public in 1975, one year after the firm was founded. Uh, 
from there, the offerings and the number of firms that offer similar products took off. And that's really a testament to the demand for such a product and the profitability of such offerings. Index mutual funds continue to take share from actively managed mutual funds, effectively doubling their share from about 10% at the turn of the century to over 20% now. And as we saw in the previous slide, index mutual funds continue to take share from actively managed brethren. However, as we can see from this striking chart, actively managed funds have lost even more assets from another popular pa passive management vehicle, and that's the Exchange Traded Fund, or ETF. The first ETF in the U.S. came to the market in 1993, and that was the SPY, which we talked about earlier, which is tied to the S&P 500 benchmark. Since then, such offerings have increased in number and scope, covering stocks and bonds, indexes in the U.S. and abroad. There's ETFs tying to the price of a commodity, ETFs tied to the volatility of financial markets. Ironically, there's even actively managed ETFs, though these are of relatively small consequence and really not uh, germane to this discussion. Uh, however, some of these ETFs, they now border on household names, and that's really a product of industry acceptance, but also really successful marketing campaigns. So, so as of March 2015, there are now 1,700 ETFs available to U.S. investors, with 265 having launched since just the start of, of 2014. There are 52 financial firms that sponsor ETFs or, and go out there and market them. But really, 70% of total assets in ETFs are concentrated in three providers, Vanguard, iShares, and, and, and Spider. Like active management, passive management is a business of scale. The more assets that are in an ETF, the more profitable it is for the sponsor. We're starting to see sponsors rationalize on some of these offerings for not being profitable because they didn't uh, attract enough assets. Uh, 79 ETFs closed in, in, in 2014 alone. And as stated before, the breadth of offerings continue to grow. The biggest areas of growth for ETFs are, are funds that track international indices, uh, style investing like growth and value, and ones that track fixed income benchmarks. Okay, so Christian, uh, with that, what are the advantages of, of passive uh, management, specifically as represented by uh, the ETFs that you outlined just a second ago? Well, there's, there's a number of reasons why, why passive investment vehicles appeal to the individual investor. And one of these might be the tax efficiency of these vehicles. We won't go into the esoterica of fund accounting or, or how an individual share of an ETF is made. We, we'd be here for another hour if I did that. What we will say is that uh, most of these funds throw off very little in terms of taxable investment events like capital gains if you buy and hold them. The second advantage comes from their relative simplicity. An investor or their advisor knows pretty much which risk profile they're taking by buying a specific ETF. They're not going to have to evaluate an individual stock or fund manager and keep track of performance that they are doing what, the, what they, they said they would do, be it the company or, or, or the fund manager. The third advantage to ETFs is liquidity. For the most part, an, advantage, an investor can go out and uh, get out of a position in an ETF or an index fund with relative ease if their personal risk tolerance or situation has changed. The fourth advantage of, uh, is that most ETFs will perform within their benchmark within a fraction of a percentage point, making day-to-day -day monitoring easier. You take a look at the index, uh, how it did that day, that's how your ETF did. The fifth advantage is that one is one really that the ETF industry touts the most, and, and that's, that's for good reason. They have lower fees than their actively managed brethren. Fees can eat into investment performance, and compounded over the years, can make quite the uh, difference in investment return. The average ETF fee is almost a percent below that of the, the average active managed fund, a difference that active fund managers have to try and make up through superior performance year after year. But there are some disadvantages of, of, of a passive managed approach, and, and we'll touch on them here. The first of these is that the investor faces the market's full risk at all times when invested within that ETF. That works great if you have a market like the one we've had in the past five or six years. A relatively steady uptrend with, with no major corrections. However, an investor also faces the entire downside of the market during a downturn. The second is that diversification benefits of being invested in everything within an index can, can wane in, in certain market environments. So let's think about the NASDAQ in the year 2000. An investor in, in a, the NASDAQ tracking ETF 
may have had more exposure to all those highly valued tech stocks than they might have been comfortable with on a risk reward basis. They might not have been aware of that, especially if they were not watching what was in the index closely. And the third is that certain indices can serve as an inadvertent bet on momentum. A market cap weighted index, much like the SP, is in an uptrending market will see its long-term winners grow to be larger and larger weights within an index, no matter what the fundamentals of that company look like. It might not be prudent for some investors to have a weight in such stocks, uh, depending on the other investments, uh, on their other investments or their circumstances. And the fourth is the limited upside of return, that the best an investor can do in terms of their investments is the market rate of return on the risk they take. And actually, they're going to be earning slightly less, given ETFs do also charge fees. Right. I think that's an important point. The, the idea that with passive investing, you can never, uh, by definition, uh, outperform your, your benchmark or, or your index. So uh, thank you for that, Christian. And that's going to bring us to our, our last subject, our final subject for today, which uh, has to do with recent performance and future prospects. Can you put things in perspective for us? Oh, sure. It, you know, it, it's been a great environment for passive investing for a while now. And we need to take a look at why that might be. Uh, one of the reasons might be, as we talked about earlier, these, these uptrending equity markets. One of the drivers for the performance of equities have been falling interest rates. The, the rate of return on stocks look better, all else held equal, when a fixed income instrument is paying a lower yield. And this is best in, illustrated by this long-term chart of the, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield in light blue versus the median excess return of active funds. The trend down in both is striking. Uh, the, the median return of these large cap funds dipped into negative territory over, over the last couple of years as, as uh, interest rates have continued to fall. It, it may be a starting point to understanding this, but it, it definitely isn't the whole story. Like everything, active manager outperformance can be cyclical. Uh, this is a chart of uh, the percent of large cap active managers outperforming their benchmark over the last 25 years. Now this isn't telling us how much they beat by, just the percent that actually went and beat the market. So we see stretches where over 70% outperformed, like right after the tech bubble popped in early 2000s. And there was a nice run after the 2009 housing bubble popped. We also see periods where only 20 or 30% are beating the market, like when the tech bubble ran up or last year in 2014. What we see is that often after active management as an industry underperforms, it often has a relatively good year not too long after that. And going back to our interest rate theory, let's take a look at 2013. Uh, you, we see the spike there and that's an interesting e example. The market received some interest rate volatility uh, when U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke said that quantitative easing would have to come to an end someday. We saw interest rates go up, and those upward moves in rates, even if temporary, are seen as a big reason why active managers outperformed. So if one takes a look at the really long-term view, active versus passive can be seen as a toss-up. In theory, large cap stocks, your Apples, IBMs, and Nikes, should be the, hard, the hardest area of the market to, to really beat the benchmark. You have a lot of firms with a lot of analysts covering these stocks, and being able to find consistent market beating information should be really tough to do. Even within this space, there are large periods of outperformance. In the lead up to the tech bubble, it was really hard to beat the benchmark. You were either in the relatively small number of stocks that were driving the benchmark return, or you were not. If you were concerned with valuations, it became increasingly hard to justify being invested in those names that were driving those returns as the valuations went through the roof. And if you were out of those names, your relative performance suffered. In the years after that, after the tech bubble burst, active, ma active managers beat passive by an average of 1.4%, as we can see. And, and this same pattern persists within the mid-cap space and the small-cap space, uh, where because fewer people are covering these companies, it's theoretically easier to gain the advantage that everyone's looking for. But we see some of the cyclicality there as well. So over 30 years, it seems like a coin flip. Active has outperformed the benchmark 16 times, underperformed 14 times. But as we saw from the chart against interest rates, the magnitude of that outperformance has been shrinking, possibly due to this long falling interest rate regime or, or possibly because of 
what we're talking about here with more people chasing the same information. So because it is such a hot topic due uh, to active management's dreadful relative performance in 2014, there's a lot of research being done on why and when active management outperforms its passive peers. Uh, I, I must get two or three pieces a week in my research inbox on this subject. Uh, this slide sums up the regimes when each may outperform, but this list is by no means foolproof or definitive. Active management outperforms when there's a high dispersion of returns of stocks and index. That is, when we aren't in a market where everything is moving in the same direction by the same amount. The second is that active management seems to do well during most market downturns. This goes back to the notion that active portfolio managers can dial up or dial down risk in accordance to what we see in the market. The third is, is that during, in times of wide breadth of, of market leadership, and think back, again back to that tech bubble, when a relative few number of stocks were driving the lion's share of an index's return. If you have a market where multiple stocks in multiple sectors are driving the upside of returns, it really is a, a bit better of an environment to, to be a stock picker, trust me. Uh, passive strategy outperformances have their tendencies too, though. Uh, they tend to outperform in, in times when the equity markets are trending steadily higher, like the last five years. They outperform when there's a high correlation between index constituents, and thus makes it harder for active managers to find any stocks to act differently in a way to outperform the index. We went through a span of this where there was a high correlation between stocks for a few years, and we're seeing some of that fade now. They also outperform in what we would call narrow market leadership, like an aging bull market that, that is sort of like the one that we have now. Each market high is seeing fewer and fewer stocks hitting their corresponding 52-week highs along with it, leading one to believe that these gains are being caused by a smaller and smaller number of stocks. And finally, uh, according to the research, it seems passive outperforms in times of, of falling interest rates. Okay. Thank you, Christian. So we've gone through the advantages and disadvantages of active versus passive, we've talked about cyclicality. So all this comes down to one question, which way is the right way? Well, the financial advisors and consultants that tackle this question each and every day, they really take a nuanced view on this. A majority of them think that passive and active each really do have a home in your portfolio. If you read enough industry pieces and white papers on this subject, a theme really does start to form. And that they tend to say that an actively managed strategy can make a good core for your portfolio. And that an investor can match their level of risk tolerance or avoidance, their, their time horizon constraints and investment style concerns with a properly monitored stable of an active management strategies. Uh, and, and I, uh, on fees and those tax consequences that we talked about earlier, those are really key here. Passively managed vehicles might be a good way to gain exposure to a new asset class or style that isn't really a core holding in their portfolio but the investor might have a budding interest in, or where owning the underlying asset could be a hassle. It, it gives an investor, it could give an investor uh, an idea of how this asset class acts in, in certain times of economic stress or success. The liquidity of the ETF or fund here is key, as, under, as is understanding the risks of it, or, and of course, you also have to understand the fees there as well. With the Azad Ethical Fund, we feel that we have an offering that, that can fall within the investor's core portfolio that we talked about. We're invested in mid-cap growth U.S. equities, and those are names that are often in the, in the most attractive part of the corporate life cycle. Our focus on companies that have sustainable businesses, that have passed well-developed ethical screens, uh, that's really an offering that isn't readily available within the, in the ETF universe. Our fund allows investors to access a market cycle tested investment process at fees that are below the category average. Okay, and on that subject, we'll go ahead and show the attendees today the latest sector diversification, top holdings, fund information for the Athot Ethical Fund that, that you, Christian Greiner, uh, so expertly managed for us. Um, we'll go ahead and get set up to take some questions from the audience. Um, I am going to, per usual, uh, decide to enact the presenter's prerogative or take advantage of it and ask the first question. It'll hopefully give folks a chance to think about what they want to ask using that chat feature in the control panel of GoToWebinar. And Christian, that, that first question has to do with some sort of late-breaking news. Right before we jumped on, the, uh, the, the news was that the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve has essentially uh, downgraded its forecast for U.S. 
GDP growth in 2015, uh, but also maintain that we are still likely to see an interest rate hike uh, sometime uh, later this year. So with that in mind, how might an active versus passive strategy uh, play out in, in this uh, sort of situation or set of circumstances? Well, you know, it's always hard to tell with short-term moves, and that there will be other things that will be moving the markets here, uh, you know, this summer. Obviously, we'll all be keeping our eyes on Europe as, as well as the Fed. But I think it sort of comes down to that slide we took a, a look at a, a little while ago, that, you know, sooner or later, interest rates are going to rise, and that could be something that, that's good for active management, uh, as long as they're aware of uh, why, why interest rates are, are rising and, uh, you know, some of the reasoning behind the Fed's moves. And, uh, you know, if we take a look at it, uh, that the, the upward movement of rates often doesn't mean that it will be bad for the markets immediately, uh, that uh, we can raise rates and the market can keep on going, the economy can keep on going uh, with a, a, good a good level of strength. So, you know, from what we've seen today, uh, you know, they might raise rates once or even twice this year, but you know, sooner or later we're going to be going on that on that tightening cycle, and uh, that might be good for active managers. Right. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. I'm going to at this point go ahead and uh, briefly uh, put up those disclosures on your screen so you can have a, a chance to look at those so our compliance department doesn't get too upset with us. And uh, if there are any other questions, we can take those now. Uh, otherwise, we'll we'll try to be respectful of everyone's time and. Uh, maybe get out of here uh, a little bit uh, earlier than I originally thought, so just under an hour. All right, hopefully you've had a chance to read the disclosures. Uh, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap it up, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your time. I'd like to thank Christian Griner for being with us today. Thank you, Christian. It's my pleasure, Josh. Just a quick note, please visit our website, azadfunds.com, where you can download and read your free copy of the prospectus for the Azad Ethical Fund, which we've talked about here today. The prospectus contains more information about the fund's risks, expenses, and investment strategy. Uh, while you're there at azadfunds.com, you can also sign up to receive our monthly e-newsletter to get more information about our Islamic financial products and services. Finally, be sure to follow us on Twitter. The handle is at azadfunds, all one word. And be sure to like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash azadfunds. You can find us there. Let me also note uh, again that a recorded version of this presentation uh, will be posted to our YouTube page. And everyone who has attended will get a copy in their inboxes as well. So uh, be sure to take a look at the replay, uh, either on YouTube or uh, when you get it sent out to you. Thanks again, everybody, for your time, and uh, have a great afternoon.